Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We're going to cover a lot of topics here today. It's uh, the beginning of May, and uh, so we've gotten through the first four months of the year. Markets were up again uh, in between 35 and 4% in the month of April, uh, behind what's been a really kind of special earnings season so far. Um, too early to really give you a final report card, but where we are now uh, 77% of companies that have reported have outperformed their earnings expectation, a uh, pretty significant amount. <clears throat> and it does appear that roughly half of uh, companies have increased their earnings expectation for going forward. And that was, that revision upward was beginning even before earnings season had started. Um, and so 10 out of 11 S&P 500 sectors have now marked up their earnings guidance net-net across the whole sector uh, versus where it had been coming into April. So a lot of positive redirection around earnings expectations and, and what uh, market actors can expect. Now, as far as um, the Fed this week, they met, the FOMC, uh, Federal Open Market Committee met, and there was no increase in interest rates, which was well known. And then the very slight possibility they might cut uh, did not happen. And I expect that will stay the same. But here, uh, a couple other Fed things I think were noteworthy this week. First of all, both Herman Cain and now, um, as of just a few moments ago with me recording, Stephen Moore, the president's two appointments or nominations he was going to send up to the Senate for the Federal Reserve Board of Governors have both now backed out. And when I say backed out, they were really forced out. The uh, Senate Republicans, they didn't have enough votes to get through. They assumed they would get no Democrat votes. And so both of them are now out. And so we'll see who the president chooses to replace them with. But as far as Fed policy uh, machinations, the only thing I would kind of add to what the Fed uh, did say this week that I thought was somewhat noteworthy, and Mark, uh, you know, the media and the coverage is not really focusing on this. They're all focusing on, oh, they didn't increase rates and they didn't uh, cut rates. And he said that this low inflation level they're experiencing below their own inflation targets is transitory. So if he thinks inflation's going to come back up, it means they're probably not going to cut. No, isn't that bad? First of all, it's not bad, and I, I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, second of all, that nobody has any idea if this inflation level is transitory or not. For, I don't know how you could call it transitory because it's been about 10, 11 years. And uh, I, some folks in Japan might consider 30-year deflationary conditions to be transitory. Uh, but as Keynes once said, and this is the only time I ever quote the guy, but in the long run, we're all dead. So I don't really know what that means that this is transitory. Could very well be short-lived. It could not be, but I do know that no one knows. All that to say, the reason to have been hiking rates was never inflation to begin with. It was always that they were below the natural rate, the rate at which money exchanges in the economy and that borrowers and creditors would do business, the cost of funds necessary for the economy to function we were below that. It's considered to be stimulative. And when you go above it, it's considered to be contractionary. And and it creates malinvestment. It creates um, bubbles. It creates poor decision-making, bad activity through time. And and so anyways, what they're going to do, not do, what they should do and not should not do in the immediate short term is not really relevant. But I don't think anyone learned anything about where the Fed's headed this week. Now, as far as their balance sheet, as far as all of that money that had been put under their ba uh, the Fed's own balance sheet that they held in excess reserves in our banking system out of the quantitative easing process, and they've been slowly kind of taking that back through this measure of quantitative tightening, forgive the wonkishness, but I about every 10 times I explain this, I like to re-explain what this means. They have these bonds that they bought with money that didn't exist. And, and so it created this sort of um, stimulative effect in the economy, primarily on asset prices. Then those bonds that mature, they've been reinvesting the proceeds. So they're just staying level. Quantitative tightening meant they stopped reinvesting the proceeds. So they weren't ever selling bonds off, but they were allowing them to kind of roll off into outer space. And that was reducing the amount of liquidity or credit in the economy. 
what they've what they've said now is okay. We're going to put that on hold. We've been doing fifty billion a month, and that was thirty billion of treasuries and twenty billion of mortgage backed securities, mortgage backed bonds. Now, for until October, they're going to reduce the amount that they're letting roll off to fifteen billion in treasuries, but keep the twenty billion in mortgage backed. So they're going from fifty to thirty five billion. So they're reducing it, but then in October they're done. However, one thing we did not know until this week is they actually will continue letting $20 billion a month roll off in mortgage-backed securities, but they're going to be reinvesting $20 billion a month in treasuries. So the net effect will be zero. They won't be reducing or adding to their balance sheet, so that becomes a neutral activity in monetary policy, but they're changing the composition to have a little less mortgage risk on the portfolio of the Fed and more straight-up treasury bonds. I know a lot of you listening and viewing don't care about what I just said or don't maybe even fully understand it. I know some of you do. It is important. I think what the Fed is doing there is saying, okay, we got a little ahead of ourselves. Let's pull back, but let's not lose the opportunity to continue at least reallocating the way in which these holdings on their balance sheet are composed. And and remember, they had no mortgage-backed securities for uh, decades and decades and all treasury bonds. And then after the financial crisis, it went heavily with mortgage. So I think they're looking to still have a neutral effect as far as monetary policy and credit and liquidity in the economy, but at least take advantage of, uh, of recomposing what they're doing. So I probably went a little too deep into that, but I don't care because um, I think it's important. I think the productivity number this morning is probably the great message of the week. I need. I really don't want to have myself because I need another quarter, probably two more quarters, to really feel as encouraged as I am. But the quarter uh, over quarter on an annualized basis productivity increased 3.6%. Optimistic economic projections were for 2.2%. So what was already going to be a good pickup was far outperformed by reality. And this is the highest productivity pickup in the economy since 2014. So you're talking about five years. This is essentially why I'm such a big advocate for capital expenditures picking up to drive that productivity growth, because what happens is we're now getting more done in the economy, uh, and so you have rising wages taking place, but if you're getting more done with it, it, has, uh, it mutes the inflationary impact. You can't say it's inflationary and people are getting paid more if the rate of productivity out of their wage output is higher. And so you're getting that greater productivity, which is constraining unit labor cost, which is adding to profitability, adding to productivity in the economy, and muting any inflationary effect. That's the most bullish scenario, scenario one could have for the economic expansion in the bull market. So uh, early to say, but right now I think the data point looks very optimistic. So earnings look good. The Fed's on the sideline. Productivity's picking up. Um, you know, that's the, the milieu we're in that is reasonably optimistic. The negatives are that things could change. Then uh, that um, uh, certainly uh, there's unknowns around uh, global economic conditions. They appear to be picking picking up off of what may have been a little bottoming out of Japan and Europe uh, and, and China. Uh, but that's early. We'll see where things go there. So we're not changing our scenario yet that we want kind of a, a balanced, objective, middle ground spot in one's risk reward profile right now because we still believe that there are both reasons to be engaged and invested <clears throat> and reasons to be somewhat defensive and cautious. And we're trying to blend those two together in whatever is the appropriate way, client by client. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it there for the week. Um, I do encourage you to look at DividendCafe.com to get a better idea of a lot of the charts we have to back up what's taking place in credit markets. Uh, we're not ringing any alarm bells. We're not ringing any sirens. But there's just no question that the overall credit quality of a lot of the middle market, um, the, the first of all, the levered loans, the senior loans that uh, banks do, uh, that, that credit quality is deteriorated. Um, and I have a chart showing the pickup and how many of the loans that have been extended are done without what's called covenants or very light covenants. So there's less protections, less uh, collateral requirements, things like that, safety measures. And then the debt to earnings ratios in that uh, bank loan market 
in the middle market lending, I should say, has uh, about almost doubled. It was about 2.9x, which was very low at the bottom of the financial crisis. It's picked up now at about 5.9x. And so you are maybe 5.6, excuse me, but still virtually doubling. And that, that doesn't reflect anything bubble-oriented or, or extraordinary, but it definitely reflects that things are a little hairier, a little riskier than they had been. And so we're watching corporate credit. We're watching the Fed. We're watching corporate earnings. And, and we wa definitely want to keep our eyes on that productivity and the CapEx around it. Because the GDP growth last that came out uh, for Q1 last, um, um, excuse me, last week, at 3.2% real GDP was a very, very good number. Better than we expected, better than any economist I read expected. However, it was largely composed of rising inventories and uh, lowering of exports uh, well, coming in. And that, that formulaically brings GDP down. Those are not real sustainable, growthy ways to push the economy forward. Um, the, the CapEx number, what we, I would call non-residential uh, uh, fixed investment uh, w was 5.4% growth last quarter, only 2.7% this quarter. It had been about 8, 9, 10% a couple quarters before that. So it's been steadily dropping. That number's got to get higher. That, that number's got to be what drives GDP growth to fill the F sustainable economic growth for this extension of the business cycle. That's what we're dealing with now. Thanks for listening to this week's video. I, I think it was probably a little wonkier than normal, but I did cover some topics I wanted to do. Um, if you want to follow up with any of the things we said, shoot us an email. We're happy to hear your comments and definitely engage with your questions. And we hope you have enjoyed viewing this week's Dividend Cafe video.